I just drew on the table again, Steven. <laughs> Before we even start the show, I drew on the table. Jared Poland, and you're keeping that, by the way. Okay. Steven, you're keeping what I just did. Jared Poland, Fronos, Photo.com, and welcome to another episode. This is episode 43 of Fronos Photo Raw Talk, and I have a title this week. It is called How to Market Your Photography, dot, 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 The Marketing Hour. How's that Ooh, sound, Steven? Sounds good. Well, you know what happened? Basically, I went on to Facebook and I put out to get those flying solo questions like I normally do. Mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, I'm looking for some flying solo. And I can't believe I drew on the table. <laughs> I'm going to... Every week. Every week. There's going to be like spot after spot after spot of drawing on the table. It's better than beer on the table. This is true. But anyway, I put out the, uh, the word that I was looking for the flying solo questions like I do on YouTube. Uh, sorry, Facebook. And we had... 80 some come in and I got those ready yesterday and then last night I was like I would I want a few more questions I'm like I'm looking for your marketing questions so they were pointed towards marketing and I got there this morning and there's like 50 some of them 60 some and I was like well let me go through them and the first couple I'm like damn these are good marketing questions so what I did is I went through and I um took all the flying solo questions and we're going to save them for another week because they were good too but the marketing questions are damn good and I thought that it was time that we talked about marketing. But before we jump into this, Stephen, mm -hmm. it's house cleaning time. So is this where you would stop the music at the beginning of the audio? Yes. This is where well, you would do it. When you actually start photo news, that's usually when we start it. Oh, all right. All right. But you know, you only you don't do that on the YouTube videos. You know, no, that. we don't do it on the YouTube. Just Why the not? podcast. Why? You, we never did the music on the YouTube videos. Well, that's because the the old way it used to. You can do we it. We can do it if you want. You can do it. I want it to be consistent, Stephen. See, we're having... a. Uh, Discuss we haven't talked about this yet. <laughs> but house cleeping. House cleeping. Cleeping. House cleeping. I love house cleeping. Yeah, I'm I'm I'm, I a, house, I'm a house cleeper. So photo of the month contest. The new theme is vibrant colors. A lot of people are like, don't do fireworks. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not gonna do fireworks because not everybody can go shoot fireworks. That that would be really a lame topic. But vibrant colors encompasses fireworks and encompasses all of that other stuff. Uh just vibrant colors. I want to see vibrant in your images, capture that stuff, put it out there, and that's going to be your rules are you have July 1st to July 13th to photograph, have to be within those dates to take those photos. If it's not, they will be thrown out of the forum and you won't get to enter, basically. You get in the trash. In the trash, yes. In the trash because the, the forum, Father Anthony and uh, Mark, they'll, they'll delete your images and a couple of other people. So I don't have a prize yet. Last month was Road. This month, I'm trying to get Zacuto to give something. We'll see. I, all I can do is ask. So I love their we'll Z-Finder. I will say that. I know you do. Mm -hmm. And they're not paying us. I know. As we say all the time, because they're not. Uh, other housekeeping news before we get into Steven's photo news. We've got the Black Rapid Strap, a.k.a. the Fronos Photo Edition Black Rapid Strap. I've picked a release date. Ooh, when's this going to be? Saturday, July 13th. I will be releasing the strap, Stephen. It's a nice strap. It is a nice strap. Is it around here somewhere? Yeah, it's around <laughs> here somewhere. <laughs> Can they spot it? Yeah, probably. <laughs> but they may not be able to see it from the GoPro because it's uber duber far away. But it's there somewhere. Uh, I can't wait to release this. I think you guys are going to like it. It's priced at the same price as the other RS Sports uh, straps. Uh, and you that's just, you know. You know it's an RS Sport because that's what I want it to yeah. be, but you don't know the design and you don't know any of the other good stuff. So I'll be releasing that, maybe do a live show on July 13th. Um, and I finally finished watching The Flash Guide myself. How I've was it? I, it was really good. I, even, I haven't seen it I yet. I know you <laughs> haven't seen it yet. I need to let you watch it, but it's because right now it's 26 gigs and it's not complete. It doesn't okay. have the intros and the outros in or and the, the tips, tips too. Yeah. Just the tip. Yeah, Just the tips the tip. aren't in there yet, but they will be soon enough. And it's over three hours and we may do one more day of shooting. We'll nice. see. Um, but it it's really like I watch it and I go, that makes sense. <laughs> because I'm a guy, you know, I know how to shoot flash. I know how to shoot in the studio. Adam laid it out really, really well. And I asked the questions that everybody wants to learn at home. And it is the basic understanding of flash photography, just like the Fronos Photo Beginner Guide. The same thing. If you start with the basics, it doesn't matter if you have one flash or 12 flashes. It all works the same. Yeah. It comes back to fundamentals. And it's really cool. For people just getting the flash, I mean, that's something that is very confusing when you first start off. It is. Yeah. Well, like you it took me a while to master Flash. I still don't think I've mastered well, Flash. Well, you never mastered. None of us are going to yeah, master it's it. Like, but it's like insane. The one thing that I kept coming back to, the, the one just basic quick tip we had, is don't try to make... If, take, take a sample image, 
but then don't try to change three settings. Don't change the whole exposure triangle because you're just never going to get the right setting. Change one thing at a time. Shutter speed controls this, aperture controls this, and ISO controls this. If you understand those things, like you can change your shutter speed all day long, but that's never going to change your flash power. Yep. For those who don't know, shutter speed just controls ambient the light. ambient light. Uh, and yeah, anyway, I'm going into whole teaching mode for that, <laughs> but whatever. It's, it's pretty all good. good. Um, so we've got that coming up. Oh, well, you guys can still request. I'm going to pick probably six to ten people to preview it, and I will contact them privately. I haven't done it yet, so I have a long list of people that have already put up on Facebook. Uh, don't send me private messages, please. Definitely put it on Twitter. Uh, hashtag Fro Flash Guide and hashtag Fro Flash Guide on Facebook as well. Have you gotten like a million? I've gotten probably five, six hundred oh my people that want to preview it. And you're and gonna you're gonna do how many? Probably six to ten. Okay. Shelly Sherwood's one of them. Cool. She'll be happy to know that. Maybe I'll let Sam Green watch it. We'll see. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Good old Sam Green. Good old Love Sam that, Green. Uh, and Steven. Yes, sir. It is time for your photo news. Photo news. Steven's photo news. We still need that announcer voice. News. One day. We'll get it. I'll get it. You ready? You ready? Now starting Steven's photo news. With interruptions brought to you by Jared Polin, a.k.a. Frono's Photo. Before you start. Yeah, <laughs> already <laughs> interrupting. <laughs> Postman Fro was just here. Oh, yes. And you don't even know what's in the box I yet. don't, I don't. Uh, do you want to know before we film or after? Uh, I kind of want to be surprised, so I'm going to know right. after. So I'm not going to tell Steven what was in the Postman Fro box, and that comes from Borrow Lenses. They send me stuff. They don't pay me to do it. It's kind of like a trade. But Postman Fro was here. It's a nice lens. It's worth $6,000. Was he ringing the doorbell a lot? He, bing bong. <laughs> All right. Photo news, Stephen. Uh, photo news starting off. This is actually some disturbing news that, to start it off uh, regarding the right to photograph police. You're doing it again. I know. I'm trying For to lick people the who are listening to the podcast. Jared licks his microphone well, when, every time I talk when, <laughs> and throws me off. But I'm not. I'm, <laughs> I just kind of feel like I'm going to get shocked from these microphones and be like, but I'm not. The road's not going to shock me. But I just have this tendency to want to lick things. Oh, how does it taste? Well, like ice cream cone, like metal. <laughs> I love that taste of metal. Um, but yeah, news regarding uh, the right to photograph police. Uh, one of our readers, Jimmy Max, showed me on Twitter, and thank you, Jimmy, for showing me that. Uh, someone photographed and recorded on an iPhone, so not really a DSLR or anything like that, but they recorded video of a SWAT operation going on in Hawthorne, California, and the guy was just walking his dog, taking some pictures and video of like the raid or whatever, whatever was going on. There was like six cop cars at this house, and he, he's walking his dog, just taking some pictures, uh, he put his dog in the car because he saw the cops were approaching him. So what had happened is the cops handcuffed him. I guess he knew that he was going to get cuffed for just, you know, taking pictures of the police doing, he's not in the house or anything like that. Um, but he put his c dog in the car with the windows down. The dog freaked out the second he got handcuffed, handcuffed, jumped out of the window. And what had happened is the dog went up to the cops and kind of approached them, I guess, in a, a very angered way because it's your dog, dog trying to protect him. Yeah. And he didn't jump on him or anything like that, but the cops shot him. The cop shot the dog, and I'm assuming killed him, but there's actually video of the whole thing, and it's, it's a Which shame. I won't watch. Yeah, I, I actually wish I didn't watch it. I'm not watching it. I saw it on the, the, the internet yesterday. I was yeah. like, I'm not watching it. So look, we have to respect the authority, the authority. at times. But you can photograph police. You have the right you to. You can film them. But don't be dicks about it. And I'm not saying this guy was being a dick because it sounds like he didn't do anything and they shouldn't have handcuffed him for just walking around. I mean, I don't understand how you can just handcuff somebody. So I know we have police. We have readers out there that are that are police like leave an explanation on some of the legality to just somebody's walking around. They have nothing to do with anything. And you go ahead and you handcuff them because they're photographing. I, I know that you have to worry about robbers and people shooting you and and it's a very high stressful job but there's some thing you can't yeah. just go around handcuffing anybody you want i mean my brother's actually a cop in atlantic city and uh i have to ask him about this i, I didn't get a chance to talk to him about it but i want to see what his thoughts on it but apparently they arrested him because he was in the cops barricade that they but supposedly did he live there uh i don't know i don't oh, think he lived in okay. that actual house but the thing is they don't have any tape around nothing like that it was cops maybe you know a couple yards right. down the street and they happened to walk up to him and arrest him and the they, could, they, they shot his dog like six times, not just one not time. It. Yeah. But yeah, so just you don't really want to watch it. Uh, next up, BuzzFeed. They're not the only one being sued these days for copyright infringement. Perez Hilton, that we all love, uh, he's being sued by New York Times photographer Robert Kaplan. 
who also runs the photo brigade, brigade a website. Uh, he's being sued for copyright infringement of 14 photos that he used of uh, Glee star Darren Chris, who, uh, who Robert actually took pictures of. So they're all his pictures. And what had happened was he took those pictures, watermark, watermarked them with Perez Hilton on there and put them up in this big that's gallery, all did. that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's what Perez did. So Robert, uh, he asked them, he asked Hilton to take down the, uh, the pictures and apologize, all that stuff. Hilton apologized, but he never took down the pictures, which was as expected. So Robert put a lawsuit out for 150000 that he's asking per photo, which equals out to about $2,100,000. Million, $2,100,000. Million, all right. Well, so that's a lot of, lot that's, of ca- that's lot too of much money because, first of all, you're not going to yeah. get $150,000 a photo. That's, we know this. Mm-hmm. But you, you price yourself high and you settle on uh, like fifty grand. But I will say, I mean, Perez Hilton it gets a ton of hits. He's one of the biggest you know, he celebrity the bloggers, all until that kind TMZ of stuff. Well, until him TMZ off. hit it, yeah. But he's still up there. I mean, I still have a lot of friends, a lot of the girls That's that insane. love watching. Yeah, 150000 per photo. But uh, um, 150000 per photo, he, the guy did what he asked. If yep. Perez would have taken it down or he given him photo credit, done it. and Perez got in trouble with this a long time ago. When he first, when he first started, started out, yeah. he was just taking photos and drawing over people's faces, uh, and he was stealing them. And then he got a... Uh, Getty licensed because you can buy like a, a year long subscription yeah, that's which what costs do. you X you do at the radio station mm-hmm. and then you can use whatever you want mm-hmm. and that sucks for photographers because they make like no money off of yep. that stuff all right more news uh, speaking of copyright the search engine Bing is now allowing users to Bing search bong, <laughs> they're using man through with a package for you <laughs> they're allowing users to search through uh, photography licenses via their image search which is nice um but this has been implemented already by Google and all the other big search engines, Yahoo, all that stuff. Um, but it is a bonus for those using Bing, which I don't know many people that use Bing, but if Bing you happen to... their web, they're, they're commercial. I know probably Postman Fro uses it, I'm sure. No, Postman Fro <laughs> does... No! No! Postman Fro does not use Bing. But uh, yeah, so that it's nice because all the Creative Commons options are available. You can search from attribution to share alike and non-commercial, everything you can think of pretty much. So if you're looking for an easier way than getting a Getty subscription or a license, you can just look on here for basically uh, just attribu- attributed images that you can just simply post a blog or whatever you're using, Tumblr, you and just attribute up, the uh, I just wrote a note yeah. for marketing. Cool. Oh, by the way, let me interrupt because I got to do the brought to you by part. It's all good. Brought to you by, yeah, want to thank alanscamera.com. And Nikon and their Coolpix cameras, yes, I am giving some plug right here. Not going to go on too long. But somebody asked me a little while ago about what camera they should get for their kids That's that they won't really break. Well, Nikon has a Coolpix AW110 mm-hmm. and an AW100. It's an underwater camera. It's shockproof. It's like you can bounce it off the ground a little bit and not really worry about too much happening. And you can swim with it. I know that uh, Jeff Fusco bought one for his kid who's like eight or nine and they went surfing and he loved the thing. Oh, yeah. So that's why I'm doing it. It's kind of like a plug, but it's also like, hey, why not check this thing out? Yeah, it's the uh, the Nikon Coolpix AW110. And I believe it's an AW100 was the first one with built in GPS. Uh, Allenscamera.com has those. And they're also your place for all things Nikon. That's where I've bought all of my Nikon gear. Check them out for all the used stuff as well. And um yeah, Coolpix cameras. You know me with Coolpix cameras. I'm not a big over, like, I don't have a camera in my bag that's a Coolpix because you really, sometimes I don't have it yeah. or I don't really want one at this point with, with my D4 because that's what I like using. But if you need a smaller point and shoot, they make a bunch of them, especially this one for being waterproof and shockproof. I think it's a great option for people to check out. And I need something just to, like, bring to the beach one day or just parties or whatever it may be. Instead of my bringing my 5D, I'm not going to, you know, bring four grand worth of gear and right. get it destroyed well that'd be perfect for the beach i know yeah. it has like a five time zoom not that the mega the 16 megapixels doesn't mean anything but the fact that you can swim with it the fact that it's shock proof uh cold proof and all that type of stuff it's like an action camera for kids or for adults alike and you don't want to bring your dslr to the beach news. bad news right there no you don't uh next up chris godfrey uh who is the vfx supervisor on the great gatsby he released a four minute behind the scenes video clip uh, which features before and after shots of all the visual effects and CGI going into the movie. So it's really interesting of all the green screen they did, which is like 90% of the vi- of the movie. If After you're watching this, you realize like, wow, that's a ton of CGI. Pretty much these days, it's it's all about the editing. It's all about, you know, as far as uh, 
it's not really about shooting anymore. It's about just 90% of it's CGI and just everything is, is fake. <laughs> but yeah. it looks awesome. It's, it's cool just to see what was actually part of the, the movie in real life and what was, what was made up. Uh, a lot of movies don't do that anymore. I was listening to a podcast with, um, uh, who's the guy from Little Shop of Horrors? Uh, I don't know the name. Come on, movies. Little Shop. You ever seen Little Shop of Horrors? No. Feed me, Seymour. <laughs> Feed, you've never seen Little Shop of Horrors. No, well, I you have go not. go back for and the... watch Little Shop of Horrors. They built the shop. They built... Um, what, what was his name? What was, it, what was his name of the... Uh, why don't you go ahead and do my camera for okay. now? But what was the name of um, the... What was the name of the, the big plant that ate people? Guys, I don't remember the name. It's good. Well, I'm sure com someone will you comment. Check it? Yeah, check it's you, checked. Yeah, yeah, it's blinking. It's still. all good in the hood. Better son. be because I'm I'm very particular. But yeah, uh, he also did Little Giants, and his biggest movie was Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Oh, classic. What the hell's his name? But anyway, he was talking about how they built the little shop. They built the actual thing. They had 40 people, animatronic people, working the. You've never seen Little Shop of Horrors. No. It's a big plant. That eats people. I probably have, but I didn't realize it was called Little Shop of Horrors when oh. I was. How, how old is it? Older? In the eighties. Yeah, I was fantastic. I probably wasn't even born yet. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah, that's um, right. What year were you born, Stephen? Eighty-eight. Oh, you're such a kid. Oh, I'm so young. So young. But uh, I, I was watching also behind the scenes video of this isn't part of the news, but it was uh, the great, not the great Gatsby. It was um, the Lone Ranger, the new one with Johnny Depp. First off, let me interrupt you. Already, the Lone Ranger, the first marketing they did for that movie sucked. The first trailer they did for that movie turned me off to it and said, I, I don't want to see this piece of crap because they didn't put it out there right. When they came out with the second trailer like six months later, it's like, now it looks like an action movie. Now it looks like something I would actually consider to go see. I probably, mm. I, I won't, but the first trailer was horrible. So that's a thing for marketing. It's all about make the sure the right trailer is out because the first one made it seem like it was a kid's movie. Hmm. Um, but anyway, with that movie, they showed that they built the entire train scene. They built tracks, like two miles worth of tracks. They built the actual trains to make them look like they're from that time period. Everything was built and real in that movie. Most of it. I mean, there's still some scenes that obviously were CGI and, and uh, all that. But yeah, a lot of it was real, nice. which is pretty cool. News. Uh, next up, we have a photographer and videographer named Tom Parker. He created his own makeshift uh, version of the movie. I believe that's what it's called, um, that uh, stabilizer. Yeah, stabilizer. Uh, with only 200 bucks. And he, basically, the movie is 15 grand. So 200 bucks is a bargain. He's calling it the E-Steady, and he's a product design and manufacturing student. Is he going to get sued? I don't think so, because he didn't use anything part of the movie at all. So it's a totally new design, because again, he's a product design and manufacturing student at the University of Nottingham. Um, the rig only sports a GoPro, though, as of now. Uh -huh. So I'm sure he'll upgrade it. It's interesting, it. though. Yeah, and what it is is... Uh, it only stabilizes on two axes, though, uh, unlike the movie, which does three. So he's working on that and what he plans on doing. Let me guess. He's going to go to Kickstarter? No, no, no. He didn't say anything about that yet, but I'm sure that will be an option later on. But uh, he promises to work on a second generation of the E-Steady uh, that'll basically keep a similar price point, but it'll make it also uh, on three axes like the movie. So it'll be just like it. Probably a way cheaper version. I'm sure it's going to be under a grand. Uh, there's a whole video of it on the news website, video demoing showing it off. They're running in full speed. It's you know totally stabilized. It's, it's crazy. And okay. he built the thing in a week. Nice. Um, we also have some filmmaking tips, some more filmmaking tips. Uh, the sound guys behind everything you heard in the new Superman movie, uh, they put up a behind the scenes video, 11 minute video that showcases how they recorded all the sounds for Man of Steel. Um, they showcased where they recorded their sounds at, how they mixed them down. What was pretty cool is they used shotgun mics and they dropped concrete dividers from like a 50 foot crane and just recording little tiny sounds like that. They put like beads inside like a xylophone and shoved them well, around. And what that they shows you is that with photography and videography, how important, well, not photography, sound isn't as important, but with videography, how yep. important sound is to make a, a scene work. It's very important. I mean, Foley is 50% is of the movie at least these days. And they did a lot of ADR, which was interesting. Um, because they had big beetles or something around the area they were shooting, which took up a lot of the background noise. So they did a lot of ADR on it, and they talked to the dialogue supervisors talking about like how she did it and all that kind of stuff. But it just shows how much effort goes into something like you know the movies these days. It's not just all about what you're seeing; it's about what you're hearing as well. Um, also, Shutterstock founder Jonathan Oringer or Oranger, whatever his name is, uh, became a billionaire this week, which is awesome. I'm super jealous. Uh, when Shutterstock Inc. their shares rose to a record high, uh, which must be nice. 
Uh, what he is owns, it at? What's up? What it go to? I don't know exactly what it went to. I'm super terrible with the uh, with the stock market stuff. But uh, he owns about 55 percent of Shutterstock shares, which is now valued at about a billion. I think he only put 18 million in. So now oh, he's making he, about he a only put 18 million. Only put 18 million. In, but he probably didn't do that himself. There's probably venture funds, venture capitalists behind him. Well, and he started it too. I mean, he put starting off Shutterstock, he put 30,000 of his own images to to kick it off. Right. So I mean, he he's the one behind it all. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, and then we have the biggest news of the week. Canon 70D got announced. 70D. 70D. I did the, put up a preview video. We can yep. put that on the site as well. So, Stephen, when you're doing news video, please put up mine. Oh, sure. Uh, I'll be sure to... Uh, so, specs. That. Let's run them down. Specs. We have uh, basically a 20.2 megapixel uh, APS-C sensor. It has Digic 5 Plus image processor, just like all the new Canon, basically, uh, DSLRs. Now, the new thing is they have the dual pixel CMOS AF with live view which is supposed to focus just like your normal camcorder these days. It's supposed to be focusing in real time versus how it takes forever to, you know, when you're doing video, when, when you're, you're doing in video, video or yes. when you're in live, it uses view. a phase detection versus autofocus versus your traditional contrast autofocus, which differs. Um, it offers significantly faster focusing. Uh, it also has a three inch swivel touchscreen, just like the rebels and the 60 D. I like the touchscreen, mm -hmm. the touchscreen on that rebel T four. I, when I played with it was really nice. I didn't expect it to be the captive touch style just like an iphone yeah i was surprised and it worked really well yeah my uh, my parents have a canon uh one of the high-end camcorders and it has a touch screen as well and it, it's crazy how sensitive it is it works great um they also have full hd movie full hd video with uh, the movie servo af like i was talking about they have the built-in wi-fi that's a pretty big plus uh, and they have the 19 point all cross type autofocus system the same as the 7d um, which i'm surprised they haven't upgraded yet and seven frames per second. It's close to the 7D, but it's not. 7D, I think, is eight frames per second. And then the uh, ISO sensitivity is from 100 to 12,800 standard. And then it's expandable up to 25,600, but only 6,400 6, for video. Yeah, though. I saw that. And, and with the raw files, you know, it does seven frames a second. Mm -hmm. The Nikon D7100, which everybody will compare this thing yep. to, does six frames a second. Uh, and it only will take six raw files hmm. before it clogs the up. Buffer. The 70D will do 16 raw files before full raw. It, yeah, full raw before wow. you outrun it. That's so very that's nice. pretty good. That Digic Five processor is crazy. Uh, too. It's probably part of the processor and and possibly the buffer. Yeah, I think the Canons may do better buffering. And there's a whole video too, like a I guess an in depth video explaining the new CMOS sensor and yeah, uh, I mean, all that stuff. The, they the have. technology behind that is pretty insane, so I don't want to go into that. Mm -hmm. uh, but some people may think that the full AF may be good. Yeah. Now, it's going to be good for some situations, but if you're making a movie and you want to have certain points in focus and certain points not, you always revert back to doing it manually. Well, this is going to be more for like your traditional person that's just getting a camera for the family, I'm assuming. Yeah. I mean, you're, if you're going to be filmmaking with this kind of thing, you're not going to want to use that. No. Uh, or at least you probably shouldn't. Uh, but that's it for photo news. You're done with photo news? I'm done with photo news. We sped through it because we didn't have any much interruptions this week. Oh, I was quiet. <laughs> I was sitting here thinking. I was like contemplating. And and that is Stephen's photo news this week. Yes, sir. Thanks, AlansCamera.com. Those cool pics cameras. Is it my turn to go into marketing? It's your turn. I'm going to go into marketing, Stephen. It's all you. All right, guys. Let's start getting into this whole marketing hour because we called it the marketing show. How to market your photography, the marketing hour. It's good, Stephen. Better be good or you're fired with a capital F or a capital PH. That's not nice. Yeah. Are we just going to let this camera die run on its it. own? I'll get it. I'm going to get it right now. All right. I'm getting it right now. You're getting it right now. Turning it off. Turning it off. It's turned off. See that? I can do things on my own, Stephen. You're so good. I'm so good. All right. So Stephen has moved over to the board so that I can have the whole table and I will have him chime in from time to time. But marketing, I thought it was I had a marketing question down here for for me to tell everybody about before I even why does your chair squeak so much, Stephen? Uh, these are your chairs. You should you should have the answer to that. They're super squeaky, though. Did the little chair super squeak? Uh, little chair's not as bad. Yeah, no, the, the tall big chair. Ones. Maybe your butt is making it squeak. I have a big butt. I'm sorry. And you cannot lie. Of it. Yeah. You other brothers can't deny <laughs> When a little thing in your brown face gets sprung, I want to pull up tight. All right. <laughs> Sir Mix-A-Lot. The, what is the best Sir Mix-A-Lot song ever? Uh, that one? No. <laughs> My posse is on Broadway. My posse is on Broadway. You need to go check that one out. Guys, go on to Spotify or YouTube and type in Posse on Broadway by Sir Mix-A-Lot. My favorite part is Larry is the white guy. 
That's my favorite part. All right, I'm distracting myself. Marketing is extremely important today, more so than ever before in photography. And that's why we're dedicating the rest of the show to talking about marketing and answering the questions that you guys put up there for the flying solo portion on marketing with marketing questions. But I wrote some things down here that I think are extremely important. I had an email from somebody who's like, I'm a professional photographer and I'd like to work with you. Uh, here is my, here are some of my photos and, and it took me to a Flickr page and that made me sit there and go, well, why are you sending me to a Flickr page if you're a professional? Oh, and his email was not his own website. It was at like Yahoo or something, Stephen. Nice. All right. <laughs> so look, it's not that hard to even have just a Gmail account, which is considered to be more professional, but let me just say this, um, when it comes to marketing your stuff, you want to have your own website, your own home, somewhere for people to go that they can call yours. It's called your space, basically. It's not my space, and it's not Facebook. I know I've talked about this before, but it's extremely important. It's not that expensive to have your own website any longer, whether you use something like Zenfolio or you use something like uh, uh, SmugMug or something like... Mm, a what are, photo folio well yeah a photo folio we're going to talk about a little later on because that's really expensive but even 500 picks offer some customization yeah. for your own website with your own web address go out and buy your own website i use a, a site called a plus.net um it's a deluxe for business company and you can order a web address for ten dollars and 99 cents a, a year that's your website on top of that, you can get somebody to help you set up your own email. I'm sure they'll help you set up your own email. So it's at jaredpoland.com. My own email is jared at jaredpoland.com, right? That's one that I use. And then my Fronos photo. But it looks professional when you send an email to somebody and it's from you. It's from your brand, not Yahoo, not AOL. If it says AIM or AOL, <laughs> you're, you're really going way Old back school. in the wrong direction. And if you're sending people to preview your work on Flickr, that to me says that, that doesn't scream professional. And there's nothing wrong with Flickr. We all store images there. I store images there. But it's not as professional as if you send them to your own website. So that is the first marketing tip that I have for you guys is your website, your name, your brand. Send people to it. And then secondly, unique business cards. I think business cards are going the way of the dinosaur at this point and the dodo bird. Not many people have business cards. Somebody asked what my business card is. Here's my business card. I'm holding it up to this camera, the, uh, the big one. It's my Fronos Photo logo, and it says... Jared at fronosphoto.com. And I've had somebody tell me this once before where they're like, what's your web address? Actually, my web address is in my logo, uh, so that's good that it's in there. I don't have to do it redundantly. But on the back, I don't. it's my Jared Poland photographer one right here. This is the back of it because I've had two sides uh, because I promoted my photography and I promoted my blog when I had these made. Uh, and I showed this to a guy at a conference once and my email is on here at jaredpoland.com, basically. And the guy goes, well, what's your web address? And I said, what do you mean what's my web address? It says what my email is. And if you can't figure out what my web address is from my email, I don't want to work with you. It's just like, it's, it says it right there. I mean, use some common sense. I don't need to beat you over the head with it. Um, so that's my business card. I saw a really cool business card yesterday that Sam Green sent me. I'm really whipping him into shape. Uh, giving him I, no, I didn't give him ideas on what to use. I just ripped on one of his portfolio, one of the designs that somebody did for Sam Green Photography. But his, uh, he used a all plastic card. They probably cost him 50 cents a piece or so. It's plastic. It's see-through. But it has the, um, the focus points inside on it, basically, Stephen. I've seen that before, actually. Right. Well, Not original. Well, <laughs> no, it's okay. original for him. No, I know. And down in the bottom, it has the type that looks like the inside of the camera. And I thought that is pretty unique. I'm going to remember that. And also, Stephen Sutter, <laughs> Stephen Sutter, who's another young guy that I help out and mentor here in Philly, he is. Uh, he made an all wood one that kind of looks like a Polaroid. It's pretty unique. It's pretty cool. That is so cool. We'll try to get photos of these and and put them up on the site as well for the in the photo news section um, because they were pretty cool. I was going to say something else, but I kind of forgot it. So I'll move into watermarks. Watermarking is a huge thing. Steven, do you watermark? You do watermark. I do, your yeah. Images. Why do you watermark your images? 
Uh, I don't know. I think I just do it. Just I don't have any. I don't have an official website yet because I basically already just work for the radio station and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not really looking to start my own photography business or anything like that. So I just kind of watermark it for myself. People to know my name. People to know my initials. Um, it's just been my thing since I started. I guess. Yeah, uh, watermarking is always that age-old question. Do you do it so people know that it's you? Uh, I'm at the point where I don't really watermark anything. I want people to use the images. I want them to spread them around. I read something that Trey Ratcliffe wrote, and he basically puts up a, a full res 6,000 by 4,000 image, or maybe it's even larger, every single day. People can take his images, and they can order prints for themselves, which is very interesting. He gives them to do that, and he still sells real prints so he gives people the full res images to do whatever they want with except for used for promotional purposes uh they have to pay him for that so watermarking is a personal thing if you're going to do it make it extremely small in the bottom corner and just make it out of the way and then at that point if you're making it so small then you don't even need it then you maybe don't even need to put it there steven yeah you know i mean they know it's yours put your name on the page photos by steven eckert and let them and let them you know know where they can find you um and i see that by a lot of people they put their watermark there and i and i don't want to see it uh it's just it, it it definitely is a hard question to do but i, I do days. hate when people put it right in the middle and it's barely transparent so your your picture is not even really showing well, exactly and when it becomes it on, a distraction yeah. from your image then it's totally doing the wrong thing it's just boring people to death all right let me move into these flying solo questions all about marketing. Steven Sutter wrote, you always say don't use an AOL or AIM email. What was your screen name on AOL AIM <laughs> back in the day if you had one? Well, of course I had one. I got on there in like 94. 94, Steven. I got on there, I think, the same time, around Steven, 94, 95. How did you get on? Let me see. You were born in 88, 89, yeah. 90, 91, 92, 93, 94. You were six years old with a screen name? I was honestly like six or seven. What was it? Rubber Dubby, Get In My Tubby? No, it was, I don't remember that far back, but I kept the same screen name since eighth grade, which was like 2001, 2000, around that time. Um, and I've had that same one since, but I don't use, obviously, AIM well, anymore. I don't use AIM ever. Never turn it on. I use it every day. It's the best thing ever. I use Skype, and most people are moving away from Skype now because a lot of people just use Facebook. Yeah, because they can do the video chat and, or Google Hangout or whatever it may be. Exactly. I know you Google Hangout with your girlfriend well, all the time. Because it's so much better. You can do so much more things. You can oh. make it fun. You can put oh. little pictures in there. Oh, <laughs> little pictures making it more fun. What are you I two wear doing, little, Steven? I could wear a little hat or have a mustache when I'm talking to her. Oh, can you? Oh, I can. Oh, really? It's awesome. Does she like? What's your girlfriend's name? She says, put that mustache on and we'll talk. What's her name? <laughs> Nicole. Nicole. Hey, Nicole. <laughs> hey, Nicole. What are you wearing right She's now? She's probably listening to. Nicole, hey. Ooh. If I was on your Google Hangout as like a voyeur, I'd be like, put that mustache on. <laughs> show your tattoos because she's got a ton of tattoos. Steven likes girls with tattoos. Uh, she has a ton of tattoos, but the funny thing is you'd never know them unless she showed them to you. Yeah, because she's got most of them covered up. Unless she's in a bikini. She's going to hate me for talking about that too. Oh, her parents don't know. No, her parents know. Oh, her parents know. Yeah. Okay, good. It's that they don't know that you have a Prince Albert. Yeah, I forgot to tell them about that part You have too. a Prince Albert, Steven? <laughs> no, I don't have a Prince I was in Albert. Pr I was at Prince Albert Hall, or Royal Albert Hall, and Prince Albert has a statue there. Anyway, my original AO, AI, no, AOL, because I had AOL where you only had 20 hours a, a, a month to use, was make amends. Make amends. My dad picked it. He said, if I ever owned a horse, I would have named him Make Amends. If I had a horse, I'd name him Scratch. <laughs> no, no, no. I'd name him Harass. Because then when he scratched, it's Scratch Harass. <laughs> oh, I thought that was funny. Where's our laugh track? <laughs> yeah, anyway, where, where's the so click track? Make Amends was it for a long time, and then I switched it to my name, and then that was about it. Um, what were some of your guys' screen names back in the day? Post them up there on Facebook and, and, and tweet them to me like, you know, hashtag Raw Talk and your screen name from back in the day if you still don't use it. All right, Jackie Blakenly. So let's get into this really marketing. I'm sorry to bore you guys. I'm not trying to bore you. I don't think I'm boring. Am I boring you, Steven? Um, what, I'm sleeping. I'm sorry. What? Exactly. I digress. <laughs> um, so Jackie, I'll just read this. I'm still trying to weigh out the pros and cons of printing on site at the racetrack. What would you do in my situation? Question mark. I'm photographing at two tracks now, so I'm constantly ordering prints. The major concern for me would be that the dirt from the track damaging the printer. That's a, actually a good concern. I can purchase an enclosed tent to place the printer setup in that may help with that. Another concern is that the heat and humidity... 
I'm at the track from noon until 9 or 10 at night. Would the heat and humidity damage the printer? It's possible. Help, I'm having a hard time making this decision of printing myself or continue to order weekly. As far as costs, I've been working with estimates to see which would be better. I do like the idea of taking the guesswork out of knowing which photos are, uh, photos to print and letting the customers choose their own at the racetrack. That alone could save a lot. Again, what would you do? Sorry for the novel. Now, don't be sorry for the novel because this is an all-out good question. Um, when I used to do hockey uh, shoots and work for different companies, these companies would come with multiple computers, maybe five to ten computers set up, all networked together, kind of like an uh, internal website that they built with images on it. They would have uh, the website built through like... Um, Photoshop at the time and everything was linked and people would have a, a pad of paper to write down which one they wanted and then they would order it right there. They would get the prints going. Now this isn't a hockey rink so you don't have to worry about the humidity or anything uh, and it's in the lobby so it's not uber cold but it was an option that people are going to, they're more apt to buy when they're there at the race than when or the hockey game than, than later. So if you think that your business is better because they don't have to wait to make a purchase and they can purchase it right there, then you're better off. Maybe what you can do, if you're not going to print right there, you can take orders that day by showing off the images after they're taken. I'm going to say this to you, Jackie. Shoot raw plus JPEG. Raw plus JPEG basic. Put up the basic JPEGs right Ooh. after the shoot. Yeah, I just said it, but this is different. This is this is she's still shooting in the raw files that she's going to make the prints from. This is just so that she can put up a edited JPEG really quick. She can have one of the kids do it or have your husband do it or have a, an assistant do it and let people place the order there and you can have it for them next week. Uh, you can bring it out to the track. You get payment at the time of purchase. Or if you want to get printers and you want to run them quick, that Pixum a Pro 10 Prints really quick 8x10s. And you can offer 8x10s, 11x14s, 12x18s. You can even then offer poster prints to come back later. Am I worried about the humidity? Not too much. If you have a tent, I mean, I'd just tell you to go get a freaking RV at this point. If you, if you do a ton of work and maybe you guys have a a portable van like a van or something it's kind of like an ice cream truck or a food truck except it's a camera photo truck i know i'm just telling you to spend more money but you don't really have to do that it's just one of those ideas that's out there it's a mobile printing site type thing or set up inside the lobby um or you can print out outside if you have power and you can just do prints right there just have a fan with you so that you can not worry about it the dust on the other hand not much you can do about the dust flying around at the track just try to protect your your stuff as much as possible so on location is a good way to do it especially if you can get paid right there shoot print get paid and deliver all in the same time if you're able to do that or have somebody able to do that and you're out there all day and making it work did she say how long she's out there uh, it doesn't say how long she's just at two tracks from noon until nine or ten if you're there that late then definitely hire somebody that's competent to sit there and take the orders and make the prints while you're out doing your shooting because then you're leaving there. I'll tell you what, Stephen, what I made shooting hockey, and this was the old school way where I would shoot a roll on, say, Friday, the first day of the tournament, and on Saturday I'd shoot more, but I'd also have each roll printed as single prints and then occasionally have an enlargement made. I made two grand one weekend just selling prints, nice, just selling four nice. by sixes, just selling four by sixes, actually. And the other thing too, just go back on shooting raw plus JPEG. The nice thing is these days you can just set your picture style of how you want the JPEG edited in camera. So then when you're done shooting, you're pretty much have your picture final and ready. Like I usually tend to, if I'm shooting raw plus JPEG, because I know I need to give them to someone without editing them, I'll tend to lower the contrast a little bit or maybe adjust the sharpness or whatever it may be. I bump the contrast. Yeah, I know you're a contrast kind of guy. I tend to lower it, make it a little softer, but I mean, you could do all that. So when they do want to print, you just literally pop it in the printer and then there you go. You're done. You don't yep. have to edit it or anything like that. But you want to edit a lot of your, time. You want to edit the well, final ones the for The final people. raw for yourself and all that. Yeah. Yeah. If you can, and when like. When somebody places an order, you go back to that raw file, you tweak it, you yep. print it, you're good to go. But when I was selling these prints at the hockey game, I was doing, um, was it $4 a print, three for 10? Yeah, $4 nice. a print, three for 10. This is what size? Four by six. Okay. I don't think I did five, but I may have even printed the whole roll five by seven. It may have cost me like 18 bucks to print it all, and that's 36 shots per roll, and I would make sure I got the goalies because goalie parents always bought pictures. You make sure that you get try to get one or two, maybe three, maybe a couple shots of each kid um, so that they can buy three for 10, you know? It's just, it's just that was my marketing ploy, and I made two grand profit 
off of that, all cash. That's awesome. Pretty good. All right, yeah. good question, Jackie. Next. We've got Steve Dye. Hypothetical for guys starting out. I've heard of this happening all too often lately. They shoot a show, edit the pics, and then submit them for payment to the customer, giving them 14 days to pay. What do you do when that 14 days has passed? Then you send a reminder notice with a seven-day terms on that one, and that, that too has passed. Now they are no longer responding to emails or telephone calls. What would be your next course of action? Well, that sucks. Yeah. There's not much you can do. I mean, telling somebody that they've got seven days to pay is kind of a little probably putting off. I know they've already taken their 14 days and they haven't. Try to keep the dialogue open as much as possible because if you don't get paid, you're SOL. Um, so if you give somebody 14 days to pay you, uh, then they should kind of pay you in 14 days. Then you just know not to work with this client again, and it's a tough lesson to learn. I keep berating people. I had this one client not... Basically, I was working for a magazine called Fan Magazine back in the day, and they folded, and the guy stopped funding it, but I was owed like $800 or something like that, and the the owner behind it basically screwed everybody. He's like, just take me to small claims court. I'll never pay it anyway. So a lot of people went to court. They won their cases, but they never got paid. I did the other thing. I called his office every day for six months, every day at the same time <laughs> for six months. I was a kid. I was like 17 years old. So what, $800 is like everything. Well, 800, 800 bucks to a 17 year old was like, holy crap. Yeah. I can make this money here. It's like, wow. So I called every day. I got a secretary every day. And guess what I did to the secretary? You killed her. No, I didn't do that. <laughs> I killed her with kindness. I was nice to her every day. Hey, is so-and-so here? I'd love to talk. I'd like to get this taken care of. And one day he got tired of getting my phone calls and he told his secretary to deal with it. So she and I worked together. I said, I have all my receipts. I have all of this. This is how much I am owed. I'm owed over a thousand bucks or something like that. And they're like, we can give you 800. And I took it. Then they sent me a check for 800 and I was the only person to get paid and I didn't take him to court. I killed him with kindness and uh, persistence. So with this person, I really don't know what to tell you to do. Try to find them in person. Um, keep contacting them. Call them. Leave them messages. Don't do it in like, I'm going to sue you unless you're going to sue them. And then what's really the point that's going to cost you more money? It's one of those things with payments. And I know there's questions on this later on on, on payments. So I'm going to save how I do payments and, and, and things like that till a little later on. Frank Arivuzu. Arvizu. Arvizu. A-R-V-I-Z-U. I advertise on Facebook at least twice a week in 45 different local groups. I keep lowering my price, offer more. Keep lowering my price. I got to add a comma. Hold on. Comma. Offer more pictures, and yet I can't get a bite. My question is, how do I get customers? My first thing here is stop lowering your price every freaking week. Maybe people keep seeing that you're lowering your price every week and just are like, well, why would he be lowering his price? He's just getting desperate. I don't want to work with that person. Or maybe you're not advertising in the right spots. Maybe it's you're not advertising enough. Or maybe advertising just doesn't work. Maybe those banner ads on Facebook don't work because people don't read them. And they're so bombarded with them that they don't even care because they always see them. So another thing is test there's what's called in, in, in the internet marketing world and in advertising world, there's things called split testing. Run the same ad, run it three different ways. Make three different banners that all say the same thing with different colors, different photos, and you're trying to get the same thing across. Run tests. Whichever one works the best, then you work with that one next. And then you split test it against another ad. And then when it starts working so well, then you keep using the one that's working. But you have to test things out. That's what split testing is all about. Not just throwing everything against the wall and not even analyzing it. We have analytics these days. And you and 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 Facebook gives you a ton of analytics to, to look at your work, and I suggest that you use them. See which groups are working, which groups are not working. Target new areas. Target the people of a certain age demographic. Start smaller. See if you can hit those people and try to get the right job. Um, there's not much else I can say because there are so many people out there trying to do the same thing that maybe advertising just doesn't work. As you know, on my website, I'm not a big fan of straight up banner ads. I'm more of a fan of telling you what I'm sponsoring, telling you that somebody is a sponsor or product placement type stuff, which I don't do a ton of. Obviously, we have the Rode microphones here. That is a product placement. I don't mention it. They don't pay me to mention it at this point. It's just here. We use it and I wanted it. So 
you know, you got to look into different ways of, of getting yourself out there. And then if those aren't working, I, I mean, I, it's so impossible for me to tell you how to get customers. I just can't, but lowering your price and offering more, it, it's not working. You got to try something else. Raise your price, go to a really expensive price and target people with an income of a hundred thousand dollars or more. They, they give you those options on Facebook. All right, Ed, I want to get through these cause there's a lot. How long are we in? Uh, 45 minutes. Well, how's that camera? Have you checked it in a while? We got about five more minutes. All right. Um, all right, then I need to blow. I need to get through this. Ed Zeman, for us newbies, two years and under, what besides Facebook, what are the best and least expensive marketing avenues for the greatest return? Bring it, Jared. Um, th again, there is no tried and true method that is going to work for everybody. I don't... Th I Look... I thought that back in the day that I'd be advertising in the newspaper a wedding advertisement. But what the hell was the point of that? Not everybody's getting married. I didn't target that. You want to shoot weddings? Target people who just got married. Or, or not, not just got married. Target people who just got engaged. Every time your Facebook friends, you see a status and you search for newly engaged or engaged, track those people down and send them a private message. Do something to get them involved. Go directly to people. You have the technology to do that now through Facebook. But I don't think that banner ads work. I don't think that you should be buying too many spots. I think it's word of mouth. Get out, get in front of people, go to where these people are and become successful. Like Jackie, who asked that first question. I don't think she advertised that she shoots auto race, uh, these dirt car races or short track or whatever the hell they call it down there in Kentucky or Tennessee or wherever she, she doesn't live in. She lives in, I think she lives in Kentucky, but she didn't go and advertise on Facebook that, hey, I shoot these races. She went to the races. She started shooting the races. She got permission from the owner of the track, and now she's at two tracks shooting from noon to 9 or 10 at night, and that's what she did. She built something out of that, so it's very, very hard for me to tell you what is the and least expensive marketing avenues. You know what, the, Stephen? You know what the least expensive marketing avenue is? YouTube. It's freaking free. Yep. Everything is free. Sit there. That's where I got my start. I put videos up on YouTube. It didn't cost me anything to store them. Are my levels okay? You're good. You're good. You're playing with them. <laughs> always playing with I them. I know you're always playing with it. On on um, Google Hangouts with your girlfriend Nicole. <laughs> Probably. Are you sexting on Google Hangouts? No, well, I am not. What if not. Prism is watching? Chatting. What if they're What if the TSA, not the TSA, Prism? What if the NSA is watching? Stephen? They'd be like, "Who's this mysterious guy with this weird mustache?" I don't see what. Why is there a mustache <laughs> over his nose? Oh, that's not his nose. All right, back to the show. Um, there's free avenues to get out there. Facebook is freaking free. Do something. Uh, don't buy. Don't worry about buying stuff. And here's another thing. There was a guy on Twitter, and I'm not a big fan of people saying, hey, post this or repost this or help me out, please. I need some more of this. This guy was putting up on Twitter that he will pay. He will donate one dollar for every five likes he gets to his Facebook page to charity. And I responded back and I said, I don't like what you're doing. So, no, I won't be doing this. And he's like, but why? I'm like, because you're buying Facebook likes, basically, and you're using charity as a way to try and and get that. And yes, I will say this, that I did sell um, the Back to the Future shirts and we gave, I don't, what was the percentage? I forget the percentage of profits to charity, but when it came to this thing and asking me to share it out there. I was just like, no, I, you're buying Facebook likes. You're, you're going out there and you're saying, hey, for every five likes I get, I'm going to donate to charity. But the wrong thing here is the fact that you are saying, I don't care what type of reader likes my page. You're not qualifying them. The only thing they're doing is they're liking your Facebook page and they may not even care about your photography. So why not target photographers and get them to like your page? You could have 5,000 likes from people that you don't know that don't give a crap about your work or you could have 50 people that give a crap about what you're doing that pay attention to everything that you say. Those are the people that you want to engage with, not people that are fake, not people like the people that buy. There are people out there 
there who buy Twitter followers. There's people out there who buy YouTube views and YouTube subscribers and Facebook likes. That is bullshit. That is crap. You're buying vanity. Those are vanity numbers. So anytime you think that you need to compete with somebody that has, say, you're like, wow, how did they get 30,000 subscribers or followers? Well, there's websites out there on Twitter that you can look up to see how many of those are fake and actually active. Um, that stuff is out there, but you j don't buy hits. Don't buy likes. That's vanity. That doesn't get you to your goal. Like I said, you're better off with 50 people that give a crap than a thousand people who don't even know who you are. They, I don't even know who you are anymore. Next question. It's a good question, though. Damon Stinky. What is the best idea to approach insurance for your gear and, and business? This is a fantastic question. Steven, do you have insurance on your gear? I do. What do you have? I actually have renter's insurance on my gear. That is the worst type of insurance you should have. Well, that's good. That is the worst type of insurance, Stephen, that you can have on your gear. I am going to give you my guy's number, all right, at Erie Insurance. Uh, his name is Tom Ferran. I don't know if he can – I have to ask him if he can do out of state. I'm sure he can, but – I have what's called a marine midland policy. Steven, what is your deductible? Uh, I'm not even sure because exactly. I never had to use it. Well, what does it cover? Uh, I think it covers about 25 grand. And how year. much is it a year? Uh, 80 bucks. I, there's something wrong with homeowners because I don't think homeowners protects outside of the home. No, no. Renters, renters protects every... Uh, my dad works in insurance and he specifically checked out this plan for me because of that. And uh, apparently that plan covers my stuff outside my house. Does it cover it if it gets stolen? Uh, I'm not sure about theft. Broken? Uh, I th think it's covers if it's broken. I mean, what does it cover then? It covers pretty much like, you know, if, if, if it's damaged or something like that. I mean, I haven't specifically like looked into it for a while. It's been months since I got it. Bring but your policy over. Let's take a look and let's talk to your dad about it. Because from what I've been told or what I've read is that homeowners or renters is not the best thing to have because it covers that but it also covers every it may cover other things in your house and it may not give you the right coverage if something gets stolen you're not going to get that stuff replaced possibly yeah i think this does cover theft all right let's bring it in i think i looked that specifically i wanted that let's bring it in because let me tell you about the marine midland policy uh -huh. it covers everything it covers if it's broken not broken from wear and tear but if somebody steals it if you run it over with a car if you drop it in the water if it gets stolen you file a claim now I'm never do insurance fraud. That is the worst thing you could ever, ever consider doing like lying about something getting stolen. Uh, that is bad. But the, what I have for the Marine Midland policy, not only does it cover my gear, $30,000 worth of gear, and that's whatever gear gets stolen up to $30,000. Plus I also have a liability insurance that's included. I've got like $3 million in liability if somebody trips over a bag and tries to sue me or something like that. So the Marine Midland policy does this. It may cost me five or 600 bucks a year, Stephen. I know that that's more expensive than your, your renters, but I'd like to see what the renters covers because I know that I, I went into a long discussion with my guy at Erie about this a long time ago. Also, my college professor was the guy who recommended this guy, and the policy has worked very, very well for me. We haven't had issues like... Um, it covers my laptop, and at one point, a laptop was stolen, and we reported it, filed a claim, and they replaced it for the value plus extra for loading the software back on. There's a lot that goes into it. So partly paying a little bit more may give you less hassle in the back end if something does go wrong. But Marine Midland policy, plus if you're working as a photographer, you want to have coverage for liability if somebody trips over your gear or you hit somebody with a monopod in the head. Because <laughs> that happens all the time. Yeah. Actually, that's called um, that's called battery, and you'll go to jail. All right, Stephen, I, I am having trouble coming up with prices packages for my new photography business. So, if there's one question that I get the most, or up there in the top ten or top five, it's well, how do I price my photography? I'll just run through the basics that that of an idea. I cannot tell you how you should price your work. It's based off of what is your time worth. If you work a day job, what do you make at a, your day job? Do you make $10 an hour? Do you make $20 an hour? Do you make $100 an hour? What is your time worth? You have to start with that. Is $20 worth a five-hour shoot? Probably not. Sometimes you do that, though, because you need to make a little bit. But when you're pricing something, let's take a four-hour shoot as an example, it's a shoot in the park with a girl and her dog, a girl and her dog, Stephen, in the park. 
you have, let's say, you're going to photograph her in the park and you're going to deliver her final proof, uh, fi final images for her to use on Facebook. You're going to deliver everything digitally. You're going to say, let's meet in the park. We're going to shoot for about an hour. You've got what to take into consideration. You've got your travel time to and from where you're going. That's a half an hour, depending on where you're going, if not an hour. You've got your time to photograph. That's an hour at least, maybe an hour and a half, maybe even two. So then you jump back in the car and you go home. Now you have to sit there and you have to edit your work. You're three hours in. You have to contact her. You have to spend the time to get her her files, and you have to spend the time to discuss things with her. You're at four hours. You're roughly four hours for a shoot. What's a good number for a four-hour shoot, Stephen? I'd probably personally do about two, three hundred. That is like a general starting point. It is not bad at all. Could you see making two fifty to three hundred and fifty dollars to shoot somebody? Yes, it's an hour shoot or so, but there's still four hours of work that's involved. That isn't bad. Twenty five, forty dollars, you know, twenty five, thirty five, forty dollars an hour. What is your time worth? Now, it's more than that. You know, if you price yourself at, say, fifty dollars an hour to get a job. I, I mean, I go on gut feeling. I go, what does this job feel like I should be making? Should it be four hundred dollars to go do a grip and grin? People that do grip and grins, they want you to go shoot a party. Would you take two hundred and fifty bucks for that hour and a half or two hours that you have to be at the location and all you're doing is quickly editing those photos and then giving to them 250 bucks is better than nothing just what is your time worth if if you're underpriced it's not that great obviously but what feels good to you make these prices up that's what i did i made my prices up and i seem that and i seem to think that they're pretty darn right. They're pretty darn reasonable for me. You're going to go do a shoot that's a grip we're in. Take that 250 bucks. Be like, ah, it's 250, it's 250 bucks. It includes this, this, and this. It includes my time and my time for editing and my travel. Make sure you lay that out for people so they understand what you're doing. So start with what is your time worth and go from there. And then Where? you also have to just before you start on to the next. Are you point, interrupting me? I am interrupting you for once. Uh, my, you have to also keep under consideration, you know, what their budget is. If it's someone that's, you know, a little rich, or if there's someone that doesn't have much money to give away for photographers. Uh, my brother, for example, just got his engagement pictures done. He lives in New Orleans. Keep in mind, I would have done them if he was up here. But uh, he, I think they charged three hundred for like an hour shoot. And he was actually pretty upset about it. He says that that was too overpriced, that kind of stuff. And I, I, I had to try and, you know, come to the realization. I, I tried to tell him, like, this is actually the pretty correct standard. price. Yeah, it's kind of like your standard starting point. See, and I think they came out pretty good, too. Right. And that's you have to look at the quality of the work. It makes yeah. it worth it. Yep. So, you know, doing those jobs, you got to you got to just make these prices and see what works best for you. But you said ask what the budget is. Yeah. Do that first. Ask somebody, what is your budget? What do you have? And if they're like, oh, I don't know. Well, then you have to then go ahead and, and price yourself. You may not want to overprice yourself. And, and, you know, you said, depending on the clientele, sometimes we do that. That's called profiling. It's not legal for the cops to profile, but we profile. You do, <laughs> but don't judge a book by its cover. You never know that person in sweatpants with a raggedy old T-shirt could be a millionaire. You really don't. So price it reasonably based on the job. Um, and I, I've, I've, I've bumped prices for certain things, Stephen, like you said, yeah. because you know that they will or are willing to pay for it. And then that's really good. Um, and then you take uh, and help other people out at times. But that, a great thing to do is say, what's your budget? All right. Larry Sanders. How do I get my photography website on the first page of Google search? Well, depending on what it is, Larry, if it's Larry Sanders, is there like a famous, is that? Is there a, a comedian named that? I don't know. It sounds like really familiar, though. It's like Larry Shandling. I have no idea. I don't know. Well, there's Barry Sanders. It sounds like a, a baseball player or something. Well, else. there is no... I don't know any Larry Sanders. <laughs> but if you are Larry Sanders Photography, you should probably rank number one if your website is LarrySandersPhotography.com and nobody else has that. Because how do you get ranked... What is a Google ranking based off of? Well, it's based off of keywords, metadata, uh, articles that you write. So when I write an article on my website, say on the new Canon D, uh, the new Canon 70D, when I write in there the Canon 70D preview, well, it's Google's going to see that it says Canon 70D, and that's going to come up in a search result. It's not going to be number one because Engadget and every news organization out there for tech published this, and I don't rank as high as they do, of course, but. For yourself, if you're talking with your name and you're a photographer and somebody searches photographer's name Larry, you may come up. Um, so how do you get ranked? 
That's one of the way. Write keywords. Right, you know, if it's for photography, your photographer put in your area of uh, location. If you're in the tri-state area of Philadelphia, you're in the tri-state area. Photography in the tri-state area. Photographer in the in Philadelphia. Photographer in Pennsylvania. Those type of things, so that when somebody goes and searches photography in PA, you have a better chance of ranking. But you should definitely rank your website high if it's just your name. Really, you should be in the first ten. No doubt about it. If your name isn't the like Jim Smith photography. All right. What else do we have here? Jake, uh, Jack Geberhart as an amateur photographer. What is the best way to market myself? I've, as we can see, everybody wants to market themselves. I've been shooting for three years and I have really started to develop my niche, but it's still hard getting my name out there. I have found that real estate photography is a great area to focus in, but reaching out to realtors is very hard to do. Why is it hard to do? It is so easy to reach out to realtors. Okay, I'm going to get back to that in a second. Um, I try putting out free trials on Craigslist. That's terrible. But no one wants to pay me to come out for a second location. Any ideas? P.S. Uh, have you shot at Payne Park yet in Philly? Awesome location to shoot skaters. Visual, ve very visually appear, uh, appealing. Yes, I've shot in Payne Park now twice. Steven was there for one of them, shooting the 1DX versus the D4. But first off, for you to tell me that it is hard to contact a realtor... I'm going to call shenanigans on you because that's bullshit. You can contact realtors so easy. There's a million freaking realtors. Do you want to get the realtor that I'm not going to say that sells trailer parks, but I just said it. Um, you may not make a lot of money off of those, but you can still make a couple bucks going and shooting. How do you find a realtor? Well, when I go to the diner, Stephen, at the, right in the front, there's a whole magazine on houses for sale. Go through the magazine for houses for sale and see who these people are. They put their phone number there with the houses. How are my levels? They're good. They're good. They put their phone numbers there and they put their name there and you see the houses that they're selling and sometimes their photos suck. Try to get in with these people. Call them and don't give them a free house. Show them the work you've already done and say, I will work you a, a deal. Here it is if I shoot one house, this is what it costs. If you sign me up to shoot 10 houses, this is what it costs. And do it on a monthly basis. Hey, I could shoot four houses a month for you. Or do you have four houses a month? It could be $150 to $200 a house. That's not even bad. If somebody is selling a $500,000 house and their commission is 3%, that's um, $3,000 every 100000 right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's... Three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen. That's fifteen thousand dollar commission that that person is making on that place. If they paid you two hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars to give them quality work, and that helps them sell the house, Jesus, crimity crappity, quote unquote, they could, they should be hiring you. I, Stephen, I once said that to a realtor, um, I, I shoot for my my guy's name Marty Milner. He helped me buy this loft and he's a realtor guy in, in PA and in Delaware and New Jersey. And I used to go out and shoot houses for him. And I charged say 450 bucks, or if he did more of them, it was maybe 375. Um, I went and did that because I went and spent an hour in the houses. I over delivered, gave him multiple angles. I even started to do video walkthroughs. Why? Because it, it, I charged an extra couple bucks for that as well. And that worked well. But I went to say a real estate office that has 20 realtors and I offered them uh, a flat fee where they would pay me X a month and I would shoot all of their houses and it would come out very well to me and it came out to like $125 a house for a realtor and guess what the home office was offering to pay half of that for them so $75 would come out of their pocket for the 150 uh, not 125 for the 150 and 75 would come out from the realty real estate company like like uh, whatever they're called uh, hearthside realtor or bankers or Coldwell banker or whatever, and they would pick up the other half. Realtors balked at this. They didn't want to spend that money. Is that a joke, Stephen? It's funny because when I was looking at places to, to move out, uh, every picture I looked at was terrible. And I actually got offered a deal, not with my realtor, but uh, 
with with some of my girlfriend knew and basically they were going to give me I think like 400 bucks a house it was almost finalized I showed them preview pictures they loved it and I think it just fell through because my girlfriend ended up quitting that job and just I haven't talked to that lady since pretty much blame your girlfriend <laughs> blame Canada but uh yeah, I mean, it's it's easy to contact them. And it's, it's easy to contact it's easy to everybody. Shoot. It's the easiest thing to shoot. It's easy to shoot. You set it up on a freaking tripod. I use Live View. Yeah. Yes, I use Live View. You don't know what your settings are? You turn the freaking dials on the shutter speed and the aperture until it looks good on your Live View, and you shoot it raw. What I actually did is I actually did HDR, but a very realistic HDR just to bring out every, you know, the dynamic range in that room, and then I would just soften the clarity so it just looks like one of those, like, dreamy little houses, and they Which loved it. Which is fine. It. Yeah. Which is perfectly fine. You know, I if they want HDR and that helps me get more jobs, then I would do it because it's not for my personal use. It's for something it's for a client. Yep. So really, I mean, if this is your niche, then it's so easy to call these people. And if you find, imagine this, imagine doing four, four houses a, a week, Stephen, at $400 a pop, $1,600 a week shooting great money. four houses. It can be great money. And the real estate market is on freaking fire. There are so many shitty photos. And what helped me buy this place is they did a video walkthrough of this place that I'm in. That stood out to me. That called out to me. It was better quality. I got to see everything that was there. And I've spent too much time on this. But it's true. Whether it's real estate, whether it's anything else, you can find people's numbers and give them a freaking call. St uh, Sten Nison, N-I-J-S-S-E-N. Do you know any good websites or software for building my portfolio website? So yes, there are inexpensive ones like Squarespace. There's ones like Smug Mug, Zenfolio, and Photo. Um, the uh, Zenfolio, Smug Mug, oh, and 500 Picks. But if you want to do a real good website, AdamLearner.net, Stephen Boyle Photography, soon to be me one day when I decide to actually get a portfolio site back up and running. A photo folio. It's a website that they don't, they're not a sponsor. I promote that freaking website because it looks freaking awesome. It's a thousand dollars up front. Actually, it used to be a thousand up front. They now split it over four months. It's $250 a month for four months and it's $17 a month. They do the hosting, they do all of that. They give you the, you use their software, you build the site. It's freaking professional more than anything else out there. Steven, how are we doing on the clock over here? We're about an hour and seven minutes. Not in. that clock. The one over here over on my camera. I'm about to restart in a minute. All right. Yeah. See how much time left. Cause yeah, we got an hour and 23 per. Um, so somebody yelling downstairs. Sound like someone was saying help. Well, do I need to go help? No, I'm kidding. No, I'm saying that. <laughs> oh, um, what was I just saying? Um, photo a photo folio is a fantastic place. Is the thousand dollars to two fifty a month worth it? Yes, it's great. Two fifty a month for four months. Then it's a thousand. It's straight up a thousand dollars plus seventeen dollars a month after that, and it's great. The site is fantastic. It works on your iPad. It works on your iPhone. It works on your Android. It's HTML five based. It, it's it is amazing. Full screen, beautiful for showing your images. I highly recommend using it. Sam Saeed, when you start. How did you market online? YouTube. I went on YouTube and I made a shit ton of videos every day. I put them out there. That helped me with search results. That helped me get Frono's photo ranked on Google, just like uh, Sanders was asking a little earlier. So that's how I marketed myself. I started the Facebook page. I promoted. I didn't pay any promotion. You know what it cost me to promote my site for the last three years, Stephen, in advertising? Zero dollars. Zero dollars in paid advertisement because I have not paid a cent to promote my website. No, it's all been organic traffic, organically built traffic through YouTube and Google and just constantly being out there and putting stuff out into the world. Glenn Riley, a very unorthodox question. I'm laid up in a hospital for the next two months and need some inspiration. What can I do to self promote from a wheelchair? I have been updating existing pages, building a Flickr page, mostly in hopes of being selected for a rapid fire critique, uh, reading an article, and so on. Uh, sorry, read, reading maybe means writing articles. It seems like a step worth taking since I have heads up, head, heaps of free time, but isn't getting my name out to those who want to buy a work. Any ideas? Might would be uh, might be great. Wow, would be greatly appreciated. What can you do from a wheelchair in a hospital for two months? 
Well, you're not going to be doing a lot of paid photo gigs, but you could talk about your experience. You could make a video blog every single day, put it up on YouTube, talk about what it's like to be you for the next two months. And that will inspire other people to see that they don't have it that bad. You're inside and you do a photo assignment for yourself each week. This week, I'm going to photograph the nurses that come in to give me a sponge bath. That would be awesome. So as long as anyway, you do that photo. Uh, are you looking at me, Steven? No, you were thinking about it. <laughs> I just bit the microphone. I got those ticks down anyway. So you do something like that. Give yourself a photo assignment to do from your wheelchair. Sit in one place in the hospital and take street style photos. People are going to start following you to see what you did this week. What did you do next week? So put up a new video. Maybe even if it's once a week about your experiences, then do it, but constantly write and constantly take photos and challenge yourself to do assignments. That's what I recommend. Steve Bark, Steve Brokaw, what accounting and invoicing software do you use for your business? When doing a photo job, uh, do you expect payment in advance, a deposit, or do you invoice on payment terms such as payment in 30 days? Finally, do you do this part of the business yourself, or do you have a hired accountant? I have an accountant, but I do my own stuff through QuickBooks. I keep a, I keep track of everything. I invoice through QuickBooks. I bill through QuickBooks, and it just keeps everything organized. Uh, I have an accountant at the end of the year that does my taxes. It's a family friend that we've been using for the past. My dad's been using him for over 30 years. I've been using him ever since I needed to pay taxes. Um, and so this is the important question is how do you charge for your photos? If you don't know people, take payment up front. Take half up front and half do the day of the shoot. Here's how weddings used to work for me. You give me a deposit. We split the, if I'm going to take a wedding, the day that you sign the contract, you give me a third up front. That's your deposit. And then ideally a month before the wedding or a month and a half before the wedding, they send you the second deposit. And then the day of the wedding, they give you the final amount. Now, I don't always do that because I didn't always feel like I should get the people's money all before I deliver a product. But this is one thing that you can do. The other thing that you can do is you take half, you take a third payment at the time of signing your contract. You take a third payment the day of the wedding, and then you take a third payment when you deliver everything. That way they feel like you're not going to run away and they're going to, they're going to pay you for your work because they want to get their photos. So that's what you need to do there. That is one way of taking payment. Um, half up front if you're doing another gig or pay all of the day, like the day of you got to pay me. Uh, these 30 day terms, that may work for corporate America because they're probably going to pay you, but your friends and, and and business that you're doing, get that some money up front because there's expenses that you get. Hey, I'm going to go shoot your job, but I need 150 up front. It's a $300 job. Give me the other 150 the day of or when I deliver your print so you at least get money out of it. Mike Constable, would you suggest to a photographer who don't, who doesn't have a tax ID or a legitimate company yet, use Square or a product like that to take credit card payments. You don't need a tax ID to take credit card payments. You don't even need a tax ID to be in business. You just need your social security number, at least here in the US. I don't know everywhere else in the in the world. I know some places you need, like Germany, you need a license to be a photographer. At least I think that's what they told me. Um, so yeah, use Square. Use anything that you can use to take payments. But remember that you are a sole proprietor. You can be in business for yourself, but you don't get the same protection. If somebody sues you as a sole proprietor under your social security number, you are personally liable. If they sue your LLC or your other corporation, they are suing your corporation and you're not personally responsible when somebody sues you, so they can't touch your personal assets. That is something that's important to remember. Mark Hedgeslar, what did you do? What did you do to prevent friends from shooting something for free? If it's something, what did you do to prevent friends from shooting something for free? If it's something bigger like a party, wedding, etc. All my friends expect me to shoot absolutely for free, and when I say that I want something for the time and hard work spent on that on it, they look surprised. <laughs> you go, hey let me come to your job and here, let me take a car off your car lot. And you, cause you're my friend, you're just going to give it to me. It doesn't work like that. If they don't understand that it's a job and you need to get paid for it, then screw them. Don't bring your camera. It's like, I went to a party the other day and they're like, Jared, where's your camera? I didn't even think of bringing my camera because I was invited to the party and I wanted to just go. So 
here's the thing that some people do. They go, hey, don't forget to bring your camera. That's not code word for, hey, I'll shoot for free. Screw that. No, I won't bring my camera and shoot photos for free and give them to you. If it's if it's something I want to personally do as a gift, then I personally do that. Like when I shot a one-year-old's birthday, I went there with an Instax camera and I photographed the birthday and gave them the prints, uh, gave them the photos right there. That's what I chose to do. That was my gift to them. I didn't give them another gift. I gave them the gift of photos. David Rodriguez. Okay, so I got a question from a photographer friend saying... Uh, saying that she got a message from another photographer, wow, lots of sayings in here, saying that they were threatening on reporting her to the police for doing photography and charging because she doesn't have any kind of photography license. My friend is underage and charges under $100. Would this be anything for her to be scared about, or is it just jealousy for my underage f photographer friend having more business than the other photographer? What the what the no cursing are they talking about? They, you don't need a license to kill. You can just do it. You can just shoot photos and charge. You don't need it. You just need to report the income if you're maybe getting paid by Square or there's tr paper trail. If you're getting cash, yes, you're supposed to report cash, but it's also harder to track. Screw these people. Threaten to sue them for being a bunch of pricks or a bunch of wusses. They can't, I mean, unless you need a license to do this in where, whatever part of the world you're in, but what a bunch of jealous bull crap. Screw them. Screw them. I'm going home. That's my answer. Um, Darren Altman, I'm gearing up for a bar mitzvah shoot in the fall that I hope will bring some opportunities for me in the near future. Any advice for branding a name for a photography business and website name or even logo? Don't waste terribly too much time trying to come up with this stuff. Your work still needs to speak for itself, but it needs to be something that people remember. A place that you can get logos at an affordable price, if you're going to pay maybe $250, $300, maybe $299, is 99 Designs. 99 designs is a is a crowdsourced website it may not be the greatest place for the developers or the designers to be because this is how it works and i've met the owner of this it's a young guy he's in his 20s and basically you go hey i need a website design and not a website i guess they do that now but i need a logo design for my website here's my website name Frono's photo. I'm paying $299 and this is my idea. I'd like it to focus on my hair and I'd like to focus on a camera. You put that out in the world on 99 designs and maybe 50 designers pick it up. 50 designers submit photo, uh, submit their designs. They're doing it on spec. It's spec work. It's not the greatest thing to do, especially photography. It's like three photographers go to a wedding and photograph it and only one gets paid uh, the one that they like. That's insane. That's what this is. But hey, it works. So I know that Todd Wolf just used them and he's and he put out there that he'd he'd give two hundred and ninety nine bucks to somebody who comes up with a new design for Cheesecake Media. He got one guy in Slovakia to do the design. He also gave him other designs. He picked his. So you get to pick the one that you're gonna use and they get paid because you pay up front ninety nine designs. They keep a percentage and give the rest to this guy in Slovakia. Uh, so when people are doing work from around the world, it's pretty insane that they, they I mean $300 in Slovakia could be a, could be like 3 months of rent, you know? You never know. So and then you mentioned uh, bar mitzvah photography. Be very careful with my people. Um sometimes it's not worth the aggravation. I don't shoot bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs for a bunch of different reasons. I don't really want to get into them, but it's kind of a pain in the ass. Actually, it's really easy to shoot bar and bat mitzvahs because it's really just a party. A lot of the times you're like, oh, you can't shoot during the synagogue service. So you're like, okay, cool. Then you have to do portraits there. Uh, that's easy. And then the rest is just shooting kids at a party. Pretty easy. It's actually good if you can get good money for it. Tom Craven, when is it okay to sell your images copyright to a client, if ever? If they're paying you a shit ton of money, it's absolutely worth it. Steven, how much time on the clock over there? Not that one on the camera. Uh, we're about 10 minutes till I got to change it. Until you have to change a card? No, no, no. We have a 32 gig card in there, so. Oh, all right. We should be set. Oh, okay, good. Because, yeah, I, I knew this was going to go a little long because I wanted to get the marketing stuff down. Um, when do you give the rights to everybody? Steven, have you sold rights to your own work? I have not. I, I have. I did a shoot for 10 grand for three days of shooting. Nice. And I still maintain that I can use the images, but they wanted ownership so that they could do whatever they want with it. That was a buyout. I know that um, Bob, uh, Bob Gruen talked about this. He's like, they were buying images out. They were buying out shoots for $40,000. He's like, nobody ever offered me that money, but people were doing it. They were getting it. 
if somebody's offering you that much money, is it worth it? Like for wedding photos, I just build it in that, hey, I'm going to, it seems like I'm charging you an extra thousand dollars or I'm just going to include this. I'm never going to use these images. So here, use them. You have the copyright. You own these images. I can still use them, but there's things that you would never use. So make it Make it a marketing thing for you to get the job. Oh, I deliver you all of your photos and you have the rights to them. So that means you can print as much as you want. And now you're going to stand out above somebody else who isn't giving those prints, uh, that type of thing. Tom Craven, when do you think a photographer becomes a sellout, if at all? Screw that term sellout. Uh, you hear it thrown around in music. You hear it thrown around on the internet. You th hear it throwing around on TV. I don't believe in this so-called being a sellout. I guess you're a sellout if, oh my God, should I rip on this guy or not? <laughs> if you're successful, that's when uh, apparently you're Yeah, everybody calls you. Uh, what I was going to say is if your name is one brand and then you start trying to review other brand things, then that oh, is kind of... who you're talking about. Don't say anything. <laughs> that's kind of... Board, that's borderline. But I won't call the guy a sellout because he's doing what he needs to be successful. Um, he just had a bad name to begin with, in my opinion. Uh, it, it was very pigeonholed. <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> okay. On to the next thing about selling out. I get people that tell me I'm a sellout. You're a sellout, Jared. You're so much different than you were when you started. You take advertisements and sponsors. So the hell what? Do you watch TV? Do you pay anything for TV? Do you sit there through a commercial? I, when you listen to the radio, Steven does plugs. Can I say the plug? <laughs> sure. Steven does a plug every day. Is it five days a week? Every day, five yeah, five, five days, a, days week, a week, twice a day. He he does, you know, he does photo news, and you can listen to it. Go on to the uh, iHeart Radio. He does mo music news on iHeart Radio app, uh, Radio one hundred four five on there with photo news with Stephen. And every music day, music news. What music, music news by <laughs> Stephen? It's brought to you, but. Music news has been brought to you by Yingling Light Lager. Yingling and then the next Lager. day, next day it's brought, they don't do Light Lager anymore? They do Yingling Lager, yeah, and then the next day I have to do Yingling Light Lager. And so what? That's a sponsor, but who cares? That's not a sellout. You're just doing what you need to do. Well, and I, I do endorsements too. I mean, any, any company that wants to come and use my brand, so-called personality, uh, then I can, you know, work with them and, and get a certain amount of money or, or whatever it may be in exchange for, you know, doing a 30 second spot for them or whatever right. it may be showing up at a bar or, or some kind of event. You know what? It, it helps the brand. It helps you keep doing what you're going to do. And yes, I take sponsorship and I'll tell you again, I take sponsors only from companies that I want to work with that make products that I like or believe in the things that I, you know, make things that I believe in. That's why I take maybe two minutes out of this hour long, now hour and 20 minutes, I don't know how long this thing is, uh, however long this thing is, we've taken two minutes to talk about Alan's camera and that was it. That is not a sellout. That is like, hey, you know what, here's an hour and a half of free stuff. You can sit there for two minutes and, and just hear something like that. Uh, all right, next thing. I don't really believe that there's sellouts. No. CJ Vandergriff. Would it be wise? Would it be a wise move to look into having products made with an individual's logo or catchphrase on it as a way to help spread the word about that individual's business, even when just starting out as a paid photographer? Maybe not shirts in the beginning, but products such as wristbands, magnets, pens, etc. Yeah, I mean, a pen is going to be something that somebody's going to use. I had a friend over here sitting here. Their website is, oh, it's not DMB is for me. It's D. Uh, it's a shoe company. They, they sell shoes and stuff. It, they're, they're kids. The one's 23 years old and his brother's like 19. And they sell a ton of sneakers and shoes online. They're doing very well to start. It's something DND. D &D. It's not D not Do Not Disturb. It's their initials. And I can't remember their names. But it's something is for you and me. It's a really catchy name that I can't remember the beginning part. Um, but they sell a lot of shoes. So my idea was, hey, you sell sneakers and you're making $150 or $200 selling these things. Why don't you go out? I said, how much do socks cost? He's like, maybe 50 cents a pair for a good pair. And I said, well, get them embroidered with your logo on it. Get that done. because, And then just put that in somebody. Put that in their order. Put it inside the shoe so that when they go to put it on, they go, whoa, what is this inside the shoe? And then they take it out and they go, oh, it's a sock. Oh, and it's from these guys. So even when they're not wearing your sneakers or your shoes, they have to put the socks on twice a day. They put it on once, they take it off. So twice a day, they're looking at your brand. That 
is product that's a proper product thing that I recommend doing something that is useful something that people can use in their everyday life uh, that reminds them of you t-shirts I've got the I shoot raw things if you have a brand that somebody wants to wear and, and and use something that you give them then that's good give them a photo book as a photographer you, you give them a photo book as a gift a small coffee table book maybe even it's like four inches by four inches but who cares that's a great little gift um so we're well, moving on. Richard Dukeshire. Everyone is in a different place and the markets are different. So how do you find out if there is a profitable market in your area in, in for your style? Well, you find other people that are either doing it or you just start putting feelers out there and make it happen. That's how you find out if something's capable. You have to make it capable. Not everybody is going to know that they need your service until you tell them that they need your service. They don't know that they need a photographer for a two years old two year old birthday party, but you've brought marketed yourself as a as a photographer at birthday parties for kids. You do a great job. You deliver them prints maybe right on the spot, and you give them away to everybody, and it makes everybody look good who paid you. It's pretty good. I'm not saying you sell photos to the kids. I'm saying that you you give the parents all the prints, and they give the prints to the families. It's kind of like a thank you gift, and then they put them online, and then they have the tagging people. This is marketing 101. And I'm going to keep moving on. Bob, Mc how many more of these do I have? I still have another page, Stephen. <laughs> it's going to be a long one. Well, marketing and, and it's very it's very important. Bob Mc McKinley, in your opinion, when showing your online portfolio, should you simply group all the best images in one gallery, no matter the genre, or should you break out the best images into separate galleries for different types, such as family, portraits, events, weddings, bands, sports, etc.? Thanks. Stephen, is it time to reset that one? Uh, almost. All right. So this is a great question. You should not clump 50 images of, you shouldn't show like a pregnant lady, a maternity photo followed by a food photo. That may not be a good thing to do in a portfolio. Maybe you have 10 of your best photos that are the first thing that people see on a website in a slideshow that could be all over the place. But I think you need to pick the best of the best from each situation. Your best live band photos, your best candid photos, your best wedding photos you know what are you doing now also you may not want to have your wedding photos on the same page that you have your boudoir photos uh, well actually that actually isn't that bad but you may not want to have your wedding photos next to say um the dominatrix photos that may not be something that everybody wants so that could turn people off so really you have to find what your niche is what are you trying to sell if it's wedding photos and portraits then don't have a portfolio of food don't have a portfolio of kitty cats you know have it targeted to what you're looking to go after so yes separate ones but don't overdo it mark has h j s l a r Mark Heslar, Silent J. Dude, you just created a question in my head while watching your latest Raw Talk. How do you get sponsors? Nowadays, I expect them to appear themselves, uh, appear themselves because you are being famous. Yes, I'm being famous. But how about the beginning? Thank you kindly for answering that. You are doing a great job. Keep it up. Cheers. So a lot of the sponsors that I've picked up, I've gone to personally. I've reached out to them. They have not reached out to me. Most of the time that people reach out to me, I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to deal with the, the, the products that they want me to do. Sometimes somebody reaches out to me and goes, hey, would you like to try this out? We'll send you one. And... Tell us what you think. If it's something that I really want to try, then I'm all for it. So how did I do it from the beginning? Well, I started the site with no sponsor. I had Alan who supported me, who helped me. And that was just, hey, I'm going to, Alan, I'm going to send these people your way. That's about it. But over time, you've got places like Think Tank. There's all of these products that we use. And these people are looking for ways to get promotion, to get their product out to people. I have built a following. And because I've built a following, people want access to that. That puts me in a better situation than them. I don't need their advertisements but sometimes I would like them. I don't need to do most of the, some of that stuff, but some of it I want to do because I like their product and it's a trade-off. So say somebody like Think Tank or another bad company, I contact them and say, this is what I'm doing. I will review your product, but you better not screw them. If you start to screw them, they'll blacklist you throughout the community and let their friends know at other companies that you are not somebody worthy of working with because you didn't do a review of the product that they sent. You didn't follow 
up on the on the promises that you made. Don't make false promises. Don't lie about your hits. Don't lie about things. Say it like it is. I gave people my analytics. They can go onto YouTube and see for themselves how many subscribers I have. They can go on the Facebook and they can see the interactions that I've had. That is what they do if they do their job right. So that is how you go out and you get sponsorship. Jason Baldwin, Fro, I'm starting to sell some of my images. My question is, should I support local businesses and pay a premium for services such as printing and framing, or should I use other services targeted to pros that are cheaper, but perhaps even better quality? I like to support local businesses. However, also want to sell my images at the most com uh, competitive price point. Do you do people actually see value in supporting local businesses anymore? What would you do? The price can vary by sixty to one hundred dollars for a twenty by thirty frame print framed images. Uh, supply only. Um, I support as many local places as I can. I support Alan's camera. I support my GoPro being battery dead. GoPro battery dead, Stephen. So I'll just look at this camera then. Yeah. All right. GoPro battery finally died. I hate the batteries in those. That that shows you how long it lasted, by the way. Um, so I'm going to be talking to this camera for the rest of the show. Uh, and that's I've been checking it because I watched the light blink and all. I guess this is me talking too much. I hope you guys don't m uh, mind the really long thing. Uh, uh, some people don't mind long things. Some do. What do you want to do when that ha we have to reset that? What do you mean reset it? That camera. We can't well, go just, to I'll pause and then reset it. Okay. I'll probably be done by the time that we have. We have, what, 15 minutes left uh, on about that? About 17. Oh, we'll be fine. So I support my local places like Alan's camera. I support uh, my place that does my screen printing. I have been offered to get shirts from China, to get printing done in China. The problem is you don't save that much money. You don't save... You know, and money is important to save, but I'd rather spend a dollar more and get it locally to a guy that I can drive to and be at in 20 minutes or less and know that if something is wrong, he'll fix it instead of getting something off the boat and it's been a month you've been waiting for it and they screw up your entire order and you've got to start the process all over again. I'd rather deal local and spend a little more, but between 60 and and $100, you can't compete with that. It's like business cards. You can't compete with a local printer that wants to charge you $400 for a thousand cards or what ever when you can order them online and they cost you maybe five cents from to get the same quality that's like someone something like adorama picks is i don't have a local place that can compete with adorama picks and do pricing as good as them so that is i think yeah the gopro's done that is something that I, oh and i hope that i hope it continues to write the file i guess we'll find out yeah um and then the audio stops on it yep that's fine though right it's Isn't fine it? yeah yeah, see, here's the thing that we have to consider in the future. We can plug the battery into it, but when we can't plug into the board. Yeah. Anyway, back to this. Um, when it's 60 to $100 in savings, you got to take the savings sometimes. Uh, you can't always deal with the locals. They may not be the best for everything. Try to work out a deal with them. Try to work with as many as possible, like I do with Allen's and the, and the Scream Graphics who, do, who does my printing. Okay, the last three questions. David Hill, is it better to use your own name as a title or something more quirky? Do you feel it's better to market your photography with a funky name these days? If you have to resort to a funky name, I mean, Frono's photo is very, it's striking. The logo is striking. Visually, you have to get people down with the visuals and then you capture them with the quality of work. If you're just a funny name, they'll check you out once, but if you can't back it up, they're not going to check you. It's like photos by Bob. That exists in the yellow pages for anybody that still actually looks at that. But photos by Bob. That I don't want to work with photos with Bob. It's photos for freaking Bob. If his name was Awesomeness Photos with Bob, I still wouldn't work with them. So coming up with something interesting that's easy to remember, easy to spell, that is you is what I recommend that you do. Um, quirky is fine as long as it's not too over the top. You know, like sparkling, sparkling styles photography. That is, I want to throw up and eat the microphone. So yeah, I'm going to move on. Tim Candy. Fro is a great brand. What is that, a siren? Yep. What is involved in successfully developing and managing a brand as a photographer? It's about awareness, constant awareness. Oh, that's my, I'm reading my own notes. <laughs> <laughs> We've been going on too long. It's about awareness. It's about constant awareness. It's about provide, proving you're worth it. So what have I done with this brand? I've, I've cultivated it. I've taken it to 
a, a level that I didn't know that was possible. I've gone with the flow of what the direction this whole thing has taken me. Um, I've branded things very well. The t-shirts very well. People know me out there in the world because of I shoot raw and Fronos photo. It's amazing that the website has reached maybe 4 million unique visitors or so. And that's 4 million unique visits. That's 4 million people that have possibly encountered me. And it's probably less because people check with their phone and, and reset their cookies. But even 2 million people, Stephen, that is insane that 2 million people in the world know me. That's just, that's just out there. So cultivating it is just sticking with it. It's the stick to itiveness, you know, just get, keep it going and go from there. Steve Talamontes, I was wondering what you thought of posting your prices online this is the last question, by the way, versus having clients have to contact you for prices. I think posting helps deter any non-serious clients from contacting me and wasting my time, but I don't know which would be more professional. Well, don't you make this justification that you're vetting people by putting your prices up and you're going to weed out the people who couldn't afford it? I do not put my prices online. I do not recommend that you put your prices online. I recommend that you make people contact you. You make people call you on the phone. You call people on the phone. You don't give the pricing through the emails. You get levels, Stephen? Good? Good. You talk to people on the phone. You gauge their interest. You find out what their budget is. Because if you put out that your weddings are $2,500, somebody that may only have $2,000 to spend may go somewhere else. Would you rather make $2,000 for a shoot or zero? Is it worth taking that $500 off in order to get the job? Well, if you don't have a lot of jobs, then yes. I'll take a $2,000 job, Stephen. Why wouldn't I take a $2,000 job? I would too. I'd shoot a wedding for that if they called me and said, hey, I'm getting married tomorrow on July 4th. I'd be like, you know what? Throw me a couple grand. I'll be there and I'll do it. Oh, yeah. It's last minute. That's found money. So do not put your prices online. Get your prices in your mind. Have a target of what your prices are. When somebody calls, if they just email you and say, what are your prices? You contact them back and you say, what is your budget? What are you looking for? Where's the location? What time is it? How much do you need? What are you looking for? Ask all the questions because if somebody's just asking you for your prices, then then it's just budget. Then I mean, then it's just they're price shopping and you don't want to deal with them. Don't put them online because you want to make contact with people because you may be able to turn people or work with their budget. And that, my friends, is Raw Talk episode number 43, the longest one we've ever done. So long that the GoPro died and I'm glad that we put an extra large card in the camera. I kind of knew this was going to be long, Stephen. Yeah. And I told him, I warned him. I said, let's put a 32 gig card in there. Um, so that is Raw Talk episode number 43, how to market your photography, the marketing hour and a half because it's longer. I want to thank allenscamera.com and Nikon uh, Coolpix cameras. Check out that AW100, that AW110 for underwater photography or something to give to kids that they don't. you don't have to worry about them breaking, only losing. But you could staple it to their hands and then they wouldn't lose it. But then it would probably hurt and they'd cry and wouldn't be able to take pictures. But something like that AW100, I would swim with it in the bathtub and take pictures. I just know that Fusco said his son loved it. He actually swam with it in the bathtub, thought it was cool that he could take pictures underwater of the, of the rubber duckies, thought it was cool that they could go surfing and take pictures out in the water on the beach. And all you do is rinse it off at the very end. That's awesome. So guys... That's it. Steven, thank you for uh, being here again with the news. You're very welcome. All the news can be found on fronosphoto.com slash podcast. Uh, you'll see the latest episodes right there. Thank you guys for sticking with this one. I know it's a long one. If you made it to the very end, I'm just going to say stick to itiveness. Hashtag stick to itiveness out there into the world. Put it on Facebook. Put it on Twitter. I want to know that you guys made it to the very end of this episode. Uh, and maybe I'll give something away to somebody who made it to the very end. And I am losing my voice because this is the longest episode we've ever had. So I want to thank everybody again for sticking to it. Stick to itiveness. Jared Poland. Froknowsphoto.com. See ya. See ya.